So I'm here with uh, Scotty WA2DFI about an update on the Tangerine SDR device being, being built and assembled by the uh, Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Group, uh, which we talked about this at the DCC conference of 2019 in Detroit last September, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah September. So um, they're building a personal space weather station out of this uh, Tangerine SDR device, which would do a lot more than that. But uh, we were going to have a working prototype by Hamcation, and just like everything else in the radio world, it's a big hurry up and wait game. So, but you have some boards completed, and some boards are still in production. So, just go ahead and tell us what the latest well, is. The latest is the uh, first board we have completed is the magnetometer module, which is uh, a very sensitive uh, set of three axis inductors, and uh, we can measure the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, down to 13 nanoteslas. So, and it has a PMOD uh, interface on it, standard PMOD interface, which is actually we're going to include on the data engine. This is a mock up of the data engine. Plug in like this, and the unique thing about this is this is designed to be both a remote and a local board. So, in this configuration here, it's a remote board because it's got the actual sensor board on it. When this is a purchased piece, the bottom part is the part that we build. And so you put this out in the yard, 100 feet away from your station, and connect it with a piece of Cat5 cable. It's not Ethernet, it's, we're just using Cat5 because it's cheap and available. Okay. And we connect it to another copy of the board, only we don't put a sensor on it. We just leave this part off, restrap it, and it becomes the receiver end, and it hooks to the tangerine. Okay. So now we've got a remote magnetometer, which you really need because you can't really uh, measure these fine fields inside your shack with all the electrical appliances going so we need to be able to place it remotely so this is a prototype we've got this mostly working the, the funny thing about it is is that we're not really sure what the results should be so we can we can read the data but we're going like well is it working or is it not working so we're actually going to place some of these at uh, a state park in New Jersey that has official instrumentation magnetometers, and then we're going to compare our okay. results to the yeah. official um, many thousand dollar ones and see, well, how, how close did we get? Yeah. So, okay. And uh, you've probably seen this from the previous mm -hmm. uh, example here. Right now, the uh, RF boards, RF modules on the back, are in layout. So uh, the design is done. They're being worked on now. The CAD guy's working on them now. We're in our usual arguments of, well, how many components are going to be on the back and where the, the, the connector place was pretty much fixed, but everything else is free form. But the, the difficult part is making it, building it without getting interference from all this data, all this digital logic on the top board. So we have to make sure we have at least one solid ground plane between the boards, either on the back of the RF module or on the back of the data engine. And there's an awful lot of parts that have to go on the data engine. So we're thinking there's going to be components on the back of it. So now we're arguing over how we're going to keep the solid copper ground plane on the back of the RF module. Okay. And right now it's all surface mount parts. So there's no parts protruding through the, the ground plane on the back. But there's some uh, question as to whether the, some of the connectors on the front being surface mount are not going to be robust enough to handle the load. So we're looking at maybe different connectors or maybe we'll end up putting some through hole parts on and uh, RF shield or something to keep them, but to keep the RF out, out, the digital out of the RF. But as you can see, we don't have much space between the boards, so we, it's, it's going to be pretty tight. And again, we part of the delays we have is it's been evolving since right. the, the last time we met. Right. And also, we can't really proceed with the RF board and make a physical board until we at least have the layout of the other boards because if something were to change and we misjudge something, the components don't fit, the connectors, I say my CAD guy says he doesn't have enough room in here to do the routing around the FPGA, we got to make the board bigger, then it affects the RF module, so we have to adjust that. So I'd prefer not to build anything and then throw it away. So we, we'll, we'll kind of get to the everything done on the RF module and then we'll get to the layout of the uh, data engine and the clock module because the, the leaf, the I.O. board is not as important at this point, but the clock module and the RF modules are going to be necessary for the personal space weather station. So we have to make sure that we can fit them all on in the layout that we have. Okay. And it's pretty tight, so as you can see, um, John Ackerman, who's working on the clock module, 
is suggesting that this is probably not going to be big enough, so we're going to maybe have to extend it down another inch okay. out this way to accommodate the GPS okay. because they're a minimum size of those. So, But we could do that. And then we're actually starting discussion on a case, um, probably initially 3D printed, but then after that we're not sure how we're going to do it, uh, whether it's going to be plastic or metal. Okay. But you can see we have connectors on the what will probably end up being the back side and then the, the right side. So that allows us to be able to grow this way and to grow this way without really impacting what the protrusions through the case will be. Mm -hmm. okay. We don't really want to grow this out this way because then it's not planar with these connectors. So, and a couple changes that we've made, this, these connectors, these USB connectors, this is going to be changed to a type A like this one and they're going to be vertical. So it's going to buy us some more room on the, on the side here. And then we can move the PMOD down because, as you can see, we got a little interference problem oh, with right. the PMOD. So we're going to narrow the PMOD board and move it down a bit, and we'll get clearance okay. to be able to plug it in. Okay. And so, so we're looking at, uh, with, with any luck and a lot of work, we might have a prototype data engine by Hamvention okay. in mid-May. Mm -hmm. And if not then, very shortly thereafter. And the clock module will probably follow on shortly thereafter because we can use the data engine without a clock module. It's not as good of a clock, not yeah. performance clock, right. but it's at least we can do debugging and we can get the code started for right. the FPGA without having a clock module. So if you have the working prototype by Hamvention and the clock module short, shortly after, you'll definitely be in, you think you'll be in full production by the time 20 DCC happens in September? That's a good question because full production it costs a lot of money. Yeah. So we have to do some work on figuring out how we're going to fund okay. a production of run of say 500 boards. Okay. But it's possible we could do that okay. because it, and and it may be that we want to do a little bit more testing mm -hmm. because right now the plan is we we have funding to build six boards. Okay. But the plan really is we want 20 to 25 boards. So if we can secure sure. some funding to build the extra prototypes, mm -hmm. we can distribute them amongst contributors and we'll see how the development goes because really the users want to buy something it does something right. so if it without code it's just a doorstop so <laughs> we yeah. we like it to be functional uh -huh. and okay. so that that may be the, the gating factor because I can't really in good faith sell it to somebody and say well you know wait another six months for the code to come out and we promise you it'll do something right. yeah. so we'd really rather have it doing something right, right. away sure. Okay, good. Well, I know that uh, when I put up the first um, kind of the introduction to the Tangerine SDR uh, that you and I did at, at the DCC last year, um, I put that on QRZ after I after I uploaded it to YouTube. I put a link on QRZ and it just got it got it got dogpiled because everybody was like, "Oh wow, a new uh, SDR something something." Everybody's really excited about it. So I know there's a lot of people watching for it and looking forward to it and. Myself, I don't understand only about 20% of what it does. So, <laughs> but but I'm still looking forward to it, and people smarter than me are too. So, pretty good reception here. We had lots good. of people come up and say they can't wait to to get a copy because right. it's doing something now that no other STR will do. Right. So. Right. Good. Okay. Well, Scotty, thank you very much for the time. All right. I look thank forward you. to catching up with you at Hamvision and then of course DCC 2020. Okay. All right. Great, good deal. Okay. As a, as another follow up to the Tangerine SDR project put on by the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Group. I'm here with Bill Engelke, AB4EJ, and they printed the wrong call sign on his vendor badge, so I got <laughs> I gotta remember that. But this the program yeah, too. Right, right. Okay, okay. So uh, so this is now correct me if I'm wrong, this is an example which will evolve later of the web based interface that'll control the Tangerine SDR once it's in production. Right. Okay. Yeah. The way we're doing this is the Tangerine SDR includes a, a soft, a, it's a small computer, like a single board computer, and uh, that's used to control the data engine. The two of them together make the Tangerine SDR. What we want to do is we want to have a system that you don't have to be an engineer or an IT specialist in order to be able to use. So we're trying to use good principles from user-friendly design in order to uh, create uh, the user interface web-based. Uh, all the fields, all configuration can be done through the web interface. You don't have to go down and use a VI editor and other elaborate work like that. 
you can if you want to, but it's really not recommended. It's great if you let the system control everything. We're using something called Flask, in case you've heard of that. And it, it gives you a nice web interface. Uh, we like to check every field before it's put in there to make sure we don't try and tell the data engine to do something that it cannot do. And uh, i just show a couple of things here. I can hold uh, it for you if you like. There you go. This is the main screen. Uh, it allows you to pick ways to con configure the system to go through and set your latitude, longitude, and other things like this to specify what uh, frequencies and uh, uh, beta data rates you'd like to have. And one of the things we're going to add to this that's a part of making it uh, appeal to the regular ham is in addition to the science content, just collecting of data, we're also going to give you a chance to uh, specify call signs, grid squares, and prefixes that you'd like the system to watch for. So while it's collecting FT8 data, whisper data, and uh, something like CW skimmer, it can observe to see if the, a call sign that you're looking for is heard at your site. And then here's a way you can configure it to, to notify you by email or even text message when the, the call sign you're looking for comes on the air. So this will be able to run concurrently with data collection for science input. So that's the basic principle of it. That's excellent. Okay, good. Well, I, I, and like I told Scotty a minute ago, I know a lot of people are looking forward to this. So it's good to see kind of like um, what the end user interface will look like, or at least be able to do. And you've got FT8 down here right now. So you're monitoring, or this is probably a mock-up, but you're monitoring FT8, and this is the results that you're seeing down here. So people are, and I know there's a lot of people that use FT8 right now, so that, that kind of can, pe something people can relate to. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we have the ability to also add some analytics. This is an early prototype, so that's not in here. But we can do things like show you what parts of the world your system has been hearing uh, in the last hour, the last 15 minutes, the last 24 hours. Now, PSK Reporter gives you this, too. Well, we'll have the ability to send data from this to PSK Reporter also. Well, great. This is, uh, like I said, this is an exciting project. I know a lot of people are looking forward to it, and uh, I'm glad that I was able to sit down with you guys during this. So we'll see what it looks like uh, come May in Hanvention, and then, of course, at the DCC in 2020. So thanks, Bill. Absolutely. Appreciate it, man. All right. Have a good one.